One of the things I am accused of most commonly here on the channel is being blind to the uh, many faults of the Wheel of Time. And that's probably because I say things like this, the greatest American fantasy series ever told. But you know, that's just my correct opinion. You can have your wrong one. And I do stand by that. I do think the Wheel of Time is America's greatest fantasy series and debatably one of the best of all time, regardless of where you're coming from. But I am aware that's a subjective opinion, and many people are going to disagree with it. And I do want to establish that I'm aware this series has faults. Every single work by a human ever has faults. We are incapable of crafting perfection. But going beyond that, I'm willing to also admit that The Wheel of Time has objective problems. And I would like to address those here because I do think it's important that we as a community, because I know a lot of Wheel of Time fans are going to watch this just to see what does Daniel have to say that's negative, I tend to be a bit upset when people bring these up. And I think that's a problem. We can't, as a community, be close-minded to the idea of criticism for what we enjoy. Because in my opinion, the more you are able to look without a uh, blinding persuasion one way or the other of hatred or love at a artistic uh, creation, you are able to better appreciate it for its faults, even. And so for that reason, in today's video, I am going to go over the 10 biggest problems the Wheel of Time has. I say 10 because that sounds good and sexy on YouTube, but I'm rambly and often just kind of go off in tangents. So it could be at like 12 or 20 or we could run out of time and stop at eight. But these are the biggest ones that I have written down here in this Google Doc. I also feel the need to clarify this is gonna be an overwhelmingly negative sounding video because I'm not gonna take the time to like contradict every point because some of these are just problems. But yes, I love this series. Don't forget that it's tattooed on my flesh. So let's just Let's just accept the fact that this is coming from a place of deep passion and care. Now, believe it or not, I actually get inundated with criticisms of the Wheel of Time from the Wheel of Time haters online who like to point out these problems to me as if I'm not aware of them. So I'd say on a daily basis almost, I have at least one flaw of the Wheel of Time thrown in my face as I go through comment sections. But surprising to me, one of the most consistent criticisms or at least hesitations that cause people not to want to read it or to put it down is the idea of switching authors. Because unfortunately, Robert Jordan did pass. And this is a very sad thing, of course. We always want to see the artist who started a series finish it. And many people claim that the idea of another author finishing a work from an original author just completely turns them off. I don't think you're wrong. There is a definite feeling of a transitioning from one hand to another of the pen for the series. Brandon did not do a flawless job of impersonating Jordan. He did try his best, and I think he did a better job than we had any right to expect as fans, but there are faults. Matt's characterization, even Brandon has said he did not nail at the beginning. And there were some flubbed things other than that, but we'll get into those more as we progress. This one I will push back on a bit because there is an additional claim that seems to stem from this transition that I think is false. And that is that Robert Jordan started to fail as an author. The slog occurred in the series, which we will also address later. And then Brandon came in and saved it from the slog which is not true, demonstrably not true, because Knife of Dreams is what everyone agrees to be the end of the slog. In fact, a lot of people will put it in their top two Wheel of Time books. Knife of Dreams is fantastic, and that was 100% Jordan. And there are also large swaths of writing for the next couple of books that if Jordan didn't write them directly, were just Brandon kind of finishing out and polishing scenes that were at least drawn out in some way. If you want to see more on that, you can actually watch my interview with Brandon Sanderson here on the channel. I'll have a card popping up by my head. So no, Jordan did not flub the Wheel of Time. Yes, the slog exists, we'll get into that in a minute, but Knife of Dreams is extraordinary, and that is all Jordan. And trust me, from all diehard Wheel of Time fans, we love knowing that Robert Jordan did return to form one last time. But all right, I mentioned it, let's go ahead and dive right in. We have the slog, and I will not deny its existence, it's a real thing. In fact, let's go look at it. Okay, so here is the Wheel of Time. It's a long 15 book series if you count the prequel. Not something to shrug at. It's quite the investment. And a lot of people are turned off by the idea that starting here to here is largely considered a slog. That's three books. That's a pretty big space out of all 15. But remember, it's not as bad as people say. The slog is not miserable. We'll get into this more in a second. But yes, that is the slog. It's this much space. Granted, it's two of the shortest books followed by an average size book for the series. So 
pushing through is not quite as bad as people make it out to be. I maintain that the slog is exaggerated largely. So what is the slog? If you've never read The Wheel of Time, you've probably heard this term thrown around if you're in fantasy circles regarding the series. And it's debatably four or three books within this 15 book series that are not horrible. Some people like to exaggerate and claim that there's no events worth note. They're a complete waste of time. You can even skip them. That's not true. Uh, you cannot skip the slog and then just pick it up three books later or four, depending on who you talk to, and just continue on as if nothing happened. Major character defining moments occur here. And recently in Mike's channel, uh, he went over Crossroads of Twilight, which is considered the heart of the slog by many people and noted how many fantastic moments still exist. The biggest problem is pacing. The slog's pacing is rough. And I'm going to say something a little controversial here. I just, I have to Don't say- Don't you say it. They will no, hate I you. have to say this. Get so it's many the truth. Don't no, do it. Just don't, shut up. Don't you dare. Go <laughs> away. You can skim the slog your first time through the Wheel of Time. Many people are going to call this blasphemy. Many people are going to be very angry at me for saying this, and I might even lose some subscribers if people are that upset by an opinion. Robert Jordan is repetitive, which is, again, another criticism the Wheel of Time we're going to touch on in a minute. And certain scenes within the slog, you can just kind of... Okay, I'm gonna read the first and last sentence of those paragraphs and we're in a scene that's not quite so redundant. I don't know if this came down to editing or just an actual creative choice from Jordan to have a lot of foreshadowing mixed in with very repetitive uh, declarations from characters. And there's a lot of just scenes that seem to progress nothing within this area of the series. So the slog exists, it's not as bad as people say, and I maintain that your first time through the series, you can skim it a bit. In reality, though, what makes the slog what the slog is, is 99% pacing, in my opinion. The pacing here is rough. And I think if you love The Wheel of Time, though, and you're going back through a reread, no, sit through the entire slog, read it. Let yourself enjoy the moments that Robert Jordan does craft even into his most repetitive scenes of characterization, of growth. Now let's go ahead and jump onto maybe what The Wheel of Time is most known for, and that is its length. As I mentioned, it's 15 books if you include the prequel New Spring. They are uh, thick, thick boys, thick boys, as I say here on the channel. A lot of people don't like that. Uh, many people say after like a trilogy, maybe five, that's as much as they can take for a series. And after that, they're out. And there's nothing I can say here to combat that. If you don't like series beyond a certain length, Okay, Wheel of Time is not for you, and I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong. It's ridiculous for me to tell people they're wrong for that. It's a commitment, and commitments to epic, epic fantasy aren't everyone's cup of tea. You're allowed to have that opinion, and I encourage you to only read what makes you happy, because that is the point of reading in this world. If you're not doing it for educational purposes, you should be doing it for entertainment and to grow yourself. And if you're making yourself read something that is just not in your wheelhouse, you're probably not gonna be learning as much as you could because you're gonna be making yourself do it. I mentioned the repetition. Robert Jordan repeats himself. And in a series this large, some of the repetition is indeed necessary. And I don't mean large as in the length of the page. I mean the scope of the world. There are so many countries, nations, characters, magic systems, different beings and positions of power. It's just absurd how expansive and real and breathing this world feels. And so Robert Jordan, to compensate from this, very often will repeat himself. Whether it's retraining you on a magic system that you've been introduced to four or five times at this point in the series, or having a character go over certain plot events again, just to make sure you're caught up. And some people don't mind this. These are the people who maybe aren't reading this as quickly as others. In fact, I've pretty much found consistently that people who slowly read books don't mind this repetition as much because because they're getting reminded of things they may have forgotten. Whereas people like me or other booktubers who need to burn through these books often get annoyed because while well, they're trying to make progress through these books so they can have reviews up or they're just quick readers and so they're coming across the same information within just a couple of days of reading, then it tends to bother them. So that's actually just comes down to like a physics thing where it's like the slower people don't mind because you know, they aren't encountering it day after day. And the quicker readers are becoming annoyed because it's a lot of the same information, just smacking them again and again and again and again. And again. For me, uh, the answer here is if you find yourself having a character monologue about something you already know, pay attention a bit because there is maybe some stuff slipped in there. Robert Jordan likes having his hints towards the future. And sometimes you think, oh, this is just the same information again. Oh, and there's a twist, but not always. So maybe skim it, but do so at your own risk. I will not endorse skimming all the repetitive information at times because 
Sometimes you'll catch a character in a lie even, and that can have major implications. Now, one of the criticisms, and this falls more onto Brandon Sanderson than Jordan himself that this series does get, is there are a few character finales that are not completely satisfactory and dropped plot lines. That being said, this can largely be chalked up to, again, an author switch. This is one of those things where I can't push back entirely because we did have Jordan's mind at work for the series flip it over, you have Brandon's mind trying to interpret what Jordan wanted and what his notes are saying, and then working from there to finish this world that he did not create. So of course, some things will be lost and maybe Jordan wouldn't have finished everything. We don't know. I will say objectively, there is one or two character conclusions that are just not up to par with what we at the fans uh, really deserve with the Wheel of Time, with its consistent standard being up here, having a sudden drop down for a couple of characters down here is, really not okay, but it's only a couple. And in general, the ending is widely praised for being extraordinarily cathartic to people who do stick around to finish this series from beginning to end. I know personally, when I finished The Wheel of Time, it gave me the largest sense of post-book depression, shirt merch plug right here, I've ever had. I didn't wanna read anything, I just wanted to get back in this world and experience it more. And the idea that I would never get new Wheel of Time again just shattered me. I couldn't, I couldn't process it. But now we're getting the show and I have that old feeling again where it's like, new wheel of time? Oh my God. So yes, there isn't a perfect ending, but largely among fans and critics, the ending is at least respected, if not outright loved. I do love many aspects of the ending. I don't think it's bulletproof, but it's damn near close. Now there's one I can't defend as much and that's romances. Robert Jordan's romances are largely, and now they're in love. <laughs> if you want to summarize it a bit, a lot of people being attracted to each other, chemistry, sometimes being there, sometimes attempted to be there, and then they're together. It's not every time. There are good romances within the Wheel of Time. A couple of the couples, that's an annoying sentence, stand out in particular as shining beacons of examples of good writing of romance above the rest. But a few times, Robert Jordan just relies on, they're young, they're attracted to each other, they're together. Or you just kind of have to fill in the gap as the reader of, well, they've been traveling together for a long time. So I guess off page, these two started getting really into each other. So while I can't defend all of that because it's certainly not smooth and there are romances that are just wow, not good, especially in the latter half of the series for the Wheel of Time. There is also some neat explorations of romance and ideas of love and cultural traditions with Robert Jordan's creation of other cultures. And I actually enjoy those more than the romances we get that are closer to our own culture, because those are the ones that are usually the least, uh, readable. <laughs> and no, I'm not going to say, oh, they're actually okay. No, they're bad. There's a couple bad romances in the Wheel of Time. A lot of good ones and a couple great, but there, there is there's bad. But as I refuse to attempt to defend that aspect, I will defend this next one, which a lot of people bring up, and that is Jordan's different take on how he, as a fantasy author, is going to write combat. So a lot of fantasy authors will devote line after line of text to just describing action. You know, the man swung his staff so hard the stone cracked underneath as the flintlock pistol was blessed by the wizard to shoot the frog into the halfling's head. You know, stuff that's just really descriptive and it can take up a lot. And they'll sometimes describe sword forms in excruciating detail. Jordan decided that that wasn't his cup of tea. And for many, many, many action sequences, Robert Jordan will just name a sword form the character is using and let your imagination fill in the gap based off the description that the name of this sword form gives. So Jordan will just have a descriptive name that you as the reader are supposed to pick up as this puts this visual in my head. So this sword form probably looks like X. An example would be Ark of the Moon is a sword form Robert Jordan names at one point. And that puts a pretty clear image in your head of what is probably happening as this fight is going on. Many people don't enjoy this style. I kind of grew up on it, so I do. I like this kind of just artfully describing it well not. It's an interesting take and it's definitely different than what a lot of other authors who especially suffer when it comes to writing combat uh, will end up doing. I mean, we all know what bad fantasy combat reads like and it's, it's not enjoyable. And then the final final two criticisms I'm going to come into here are the classic fantasy influences that some people don't enjoy, and then the shift in the series that seems to jar some people out of continuing to read, because there are a couple major shifts in the Wheel of Time. We'll get into that in a second, but first, let's talk about the start and the classical fantasy influences. A lot of modern fantasy readers 
hear the word classic fantasy and flinch away like they touched a hot skillet. You can look at this poll I recently put up on my Instagram. Modern fantasy readers are pretty diehard and they outnumber, at least in my audience it seems, classic fantasy readers by quite a bit. And I think there's this idea in modern fantasy readers that the classic genre was just so stiff and stifling and it's just not, it's so predictable with it's just rehashing of Lord of the Rings, which is something that Jordan has said in the papers. He's, he's shouted from the rooftops that this is his take on the Lord of the Rings type journey. But I don't think that's fair because while Robert Jordan does use those similar concepts at the beginning, that was the point as an author, what he wanted to do, he never intended for them to stay those stale, stagnant, this is where we're staying, uh, just in Tolkien's shadow executions. Instead, it's all about growing and expanding beyond. And I've claimed several times in this channel and will maintain that the Wheel of Time is a beautiful bridge from classic fantasy into the more common modern standards because Jordan grew as an author and had influences that seemed to push him more towards the modern of the genre's uh, standards. So while the series begins in Eye of the World, I would say the first two books for sure read the most like classic fantasy. But then around book three, we start having this change in the way characters are developed and handled or even just presented. The way the storytelling at its soul is coming across in the pages develops. And by book four, I would say we've encountered the Wheel of Time's first major shift. And this is why I say that book four of the Shadow Rising is when the Wheel of Time becomes the Wheel of Time. It grows beyond a standard epic fantasy series and becomes one of the most ambitious stories ever told by an author because, my god, you think you've learned enough about this world and then it about triples in size. Not only that, but the characters start having trajectories that break definitely well beyond what classic fantasy tropes would have provided them. And instead, we have this much more how would this person, this human I have developed so far, really react to these circumstances? And the most obvious example of this happening for a character is Matt's development at this point in the series. He goes from being someone who no one really cares about. It's funny to see so many messages I get online are people saying, why do Wheel of Time fans love Matt? I'm on book two, he's awful, what the heck? And then they get to book four and I've forgotten to respond to their messages because I'm terrible at responding to emails and messages, but they'll send a follow-up and goes, okay, I got to book four, book five. Matt's amazing, sorry, didn't mean to waste your time. Oh my god, I love him. He's the best. <laughs> And <laughs> that's kind of symbolic of what's happening in the Wheel of Time because it feels like Jordan kind of shook off some chains of the past and really started to rumble on the level that he wanted to for the potential of his series to reach. But the criticisms come in because there's people who like the classic fantasy vibes and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to go classic fantasy, do it all day, man, because it's a beautiful genre with pros that are usually far better than what we're getting in the modern. That being said, I say that being said a lot, I think you should stick with it because it's a bridge. And if you're someone who loves classic and has a hard time reading modern, finishing the Wheel of Time could change your mindset and develop you as a fantasy reader enough to then reach into the modern genre, which I think has some of the best fantasy writing of all time. Did I just suddenly change this video into another pitch to get people to read the Wheel of Time? I did. But yeah, I also did legitimately address criticisms of the Wheel of Time and back down on quite a few because I don't think this is a perfect series. No perfect book or series exists. Every writer will have its flaws. And the Wheel of Time did go through growing pains, whether it's kind of its development or sadly changing authors. But I also really want people to take away from this video, Jordan didn't flub the Wheel of Time. That's a really, in my opinion, as a Wheel of Time fan, offensive idea. Knife of Dreams is not overhyped. It's one of the best fantasy books out there. And it's strange that that late into a series, we can say this one right here is legit, but it just felt like Robert Jordan gave that one his all in a very real way. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think of this video. Are there any criticisms you have for the Wheel of Time that I didn't mention here? Or do you actually say, no, all these things are perfect and fine and you're wrong for criticizing them? I'd love to know in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here and have a good one, y'all. Peace.